We've been talking about semi-supervised learning and in particular have focused on the classification side of things. Wanted to spend a few minutes on regression. In general, with semi-supervised learning, we're really making a smoothness assumption. And what I mean by this is that if we imagine taking a sample and, and moving it through the input feature space, making small changes to its position, then what that should translate into is small changes in the label that gets assigned to that point. With label propagation, where we were representing classes in terms of probability distributions, what this means is that as we move from one point to another, those probability distributions should not change very much. They, they might change uh, if we have several conflicting classes nearby, but they won't change very much. And hopefully one of the things that you got out of the earlier conversation was that the probability distributions by the nature of the neighborhood relationships that we were representing, those probability distributions were traveling along the, uh, the manifolds in the input feature space. And manifolds play an important role on the regression side as well. So what we're going to do is make an assumption that the uh, value that we're going to be uh, predicting should vary smoothly, not necessarily in our full feature space, but certainly along the manifold uh, that our samples live within. And then in particular, we're not going to make any commitment as to what happens in parts of the space where we don't have any samples. So those regions that, that live uh, between our manifolds. So let's take a look at a, a little bit of uh, intuition and at least sketch out an algorithm based on uh, what you've uh, learned already this semester. All right, let's start with a little bit of intuition here. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and draw out our two-dimensional feature space that we've gotten used to looking at. So x0 by uh, x1. And let me put out several points, and I'm going to imagine uh, that these are uh, training set points for which we do know the labels. So I'm going to place, uh, let's see, let's point, put point A at this location here. We're gonna put point uh, B at this location here. And then I'm just gonna use these as uh, references. And then point C at this point here. And, and let's go ahead and put uh, point uh, D at this location right here. Now let me go ahead and assign some uh, labels to these. So I'm going to put, on, put down values here. So I've got one, a value of one, a value of two, a value of 10, and a value uh, of 11. So, so in some sense, there's a, a third dimension here, that Y dimension that we're predicting uh, that's coming out of the, the page here. So we could fit a, a function to this uh, set of points because we only have four training points. This function can't be all that uh, complicated, which, which means we're probably looking for something that's linear or maybe just something just beyond uh, linear. But there's a challenge here in the way that I've laid this out. And to see that, let's go ahead and take this uh, 3D set of points and rotate them. So I'm going to uh, draw this as uh, x0 by, by y. So now these, the 1, 2, 10, and 11 are represented in the, in the vertical here. And, and so point A is, uh, is right here, has an x0 of, of 2 if this is, this is the origin at the corner. And we said it was at 1. So this is A. And B is just 1 over from that, and it has a value of 2. And then C is a value is just one over from that, and it has a value of ten, and that sits right up here. And then D sits right at this location right here. So if we were to try to fit a, a linear model to the space, let's ignore x1 for the, for the moment and just focus on y as a function of x0. If we were to try to fit a linear model here, what we would really end up with is something that probably, actually probably uh, sits somewhere right about there. And, 
and hopefully it's easy to see that that's not a particularly uh, good choice to make. Um, we might try putting a bit of a curve uh, in this. So you could imagine having a, a sigmoid or something along these lines. So, so we could have something that, that does this. And, and that gets us a little bit closer, although the error for C is a little bit big for how I drew things. We could make that S, that sigmoid, a little bit sharper to try and uh, account for that. Or we could, we could even, we could be more extreme. And let me give that a shot. So we've got the A, B, and then we have to hit C and then come over to catch D there. So that's even sharper than what a sigmoid will uh, do for us. So the, the take home point here is uh, that in order to capture this uh, function, we actually have to use something that uh, is not all that smooth. There's a very big transition as we go from this value that B, point B corresponds to, to the value that point C corresponds to. So the question is, can we do better? And so now let's, let's imagine, uh, so we, we've got these, these four points that we uh, have laid out in this uh, space here. These are points for which we know both the input features, the x0, x1, and we know the, the label. But imagine if I had a whole bunch of unlabeled points. And let me go ahead and draw in that uh, distribution of points. So this is coming in in purple, and it's sort of walking along uh, like this. And we can certainly cut out some of this audio here. Okay, so there's there's our set of uh, samples here. Now, now what I've done here in, in this construction is that I've created essentially a one-dimensional manifold and and one in which the geodesic distance from A to C or, or B to C, so th that's the Euclidean distance, is fairly short between those two, but the geodesic distance from B to C is quite far. And in fact, it's further than the geodesic distance to get us from uh, C to D. Okay, so, so if we were to use some sort of a, uh, a de-warping scheme, and, and you have some of that in, in your in your toolkit already in the form of things like isomap, then what we can do is actually get at this one dimensional manifold. We can unwarp it and perhaps we can do better uh, in terms of uh, representing uh, this particular function. So let's go ahead and, and, and do that mapping. What I'm going to do is imagine this manifold just, just sits along uh, like this. And so the question is, where are points A, B, C, and D along this manifold? And I'm going to call that coordinate Z. So let's go ahead and build a new coordinate system just down below here. We'll call that Z. And we have Y in the vertical here. And we're going to arbitrarily just put point A at this location here, it has a value of, uh, of one. And then the Euclidean distance from, sorry, the geodesic distance from one to two is something like two and a half units. So B really sits sort of about here. And that has a position right there. And then the geodesic distance from B to C, let's go ahead and count that out. There's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I counted about 14 there. And again, we're just really eyeballing this. And it's Y coordinate is 10, which sits right here. And then D is, about seven beyond that, which corresponds to here. And that's this position here. Okay, so with this remapping, if I were to, so, so this remapping has become possible because I know about these other points, these, these purple points. 
uh, but when it comes time to actually uh, build the, the full function, what we're going to do is actually represent it in this Z space as opposed to our original X space. And uh, we can actually imagine drawing a, a line uh, here, doing it using a linear model, actually captures this pretty darn well. And if I add a small uh, curve into that, I, I, can, I can imagine capturing uh, all of those points with with pretty good precision, so so I might be able to to do that with a with something just that's just a little bit beyond a, a linear function. And the other key thing here is that the slope uh, that we have in our function is quite a bit lower than the the slopes that we had, especially in this orange curve up up in this original figure. All right, so that's. That's a, a, a bit of motivation. Let's kind of talk through what that algorithm might look like. So our training set now is composed of both labeled and unlabeled data. So actually, let's, let's draw in our labeled data first. So we'll call these uh, these x, uh, x's here, and those each have a corresponding y, the value that we're predicting. And, and of course, the first row here is x0, x1, x2, and on down the line. This, and then there are the corresponding y0, y1, y2, etc. Let's focus on what the algorithm looked like originally here. So the original algorithm. Essentially says uh, we're going to use uh, uh, some sort of a model and this can be whatever whatever we want. It can be uh, regression. It, it, uh, linear regression, it can uh, be polynomial regression, what have you. So, so I'm just going to call it model, but assume that it's a fairly small, simple type of model at this stage. And our learning process then is just we're going to do a model that fit on our inputs and our desired outputs. So the details of what, what's inside of model don't really matter. Uh, in this case, we might be doing least mean squared. We might have some other uh, error metric. So for th for this particular algorithm, we have we have some sort of a sample xi coming in here. We have a our regression model, and then it's predicting some yi hat. So when we actually go to do a query, then it just becomes model dot predict. And uh, some x query. Okay, so that now this new algorithm what we want to do is now make use of an extended set of data. So an additional set of x's, but they're the, the labels over here are unknown. So collectively, I'm going to refer to all of these as x hat, but still reserve x to refer to the, the data that, that are actually labeled. So, how, so, so in our little discussion up here, what we first, our first step was to go from this space here down to this space over here, and then we used re regression on top of this uh, new space. And we can use a variety of tools to, to make this transition. Uh, in this particular case, what I'm going to suggest is that we make use of isomat. And in part, I'm choosing that because it's easy to do uh, queries uh, after we've learned a model. So what we uh, end up with in terms of our uh, approach 
is that we have some sort of an XI that's coming in. We're going to use isomap to project potentially into a compressed space. So that's going to give us our, uh, our ZIs. And then we'll use our model. And I've run out of space, so let me move that over. And then that's going to give, our, give us our YI hats. So the key here is that our training that we're going to be doing, we're going to use uh, X hat to train our isomap. And then we're going to essentially use pairs, uh, our, our training pairs X and Y to train the parameters of our regression model over here. So then the outline for that looks like this. And isomap will have some, some number of uh, parameters, and we've already talked through that, that process. So it becomes iso.fit. And now we have our x hats. We're using all of that data, both the labeled and unlabeled data. And then we can ask for our labeled data, we can ask what the uh, co coordinates are in our compressed space. And of course, this is based on our original set of, of X's here. This is not X hat. And then finally, we can take our model step. And when we go to fit this model, now we are not using our X's, but we're going to use those compressed representations. And that's, and that's the extent of the learning process. To query, that becomes a, a two-step process. So we have to do a, a we have some sort of a uh, XQ. ZQ becomes an iso.transform. And, and then our prediction is just model.predict. And we hand it the ZQ as the input to our model now is in that compressed space. OK, so that is the outline uh, of the algorithm. And uh, whether we end up doing compression in this to get down to Z, and that really depends on the nature of our uh, input uh, features that are coming in. Uh, if we have a lot of them, then compression probably is warranted. Uh, but if we have a very small space, such as what we're uh, dealing, in, dealing with here with just two-dimensional inputs, uh, then that Z space, I, I would certainly be trying both one and two and not going any higher than that. Okay, so, so the key here is that what, we're, what we've done is we've taken advantage of the, the, the manifold that we are able to see by looking at our uh, unlabeled data. Without that unlabeled data, we're stuck with fitting models in this type of a space here. But, but once we're able to uh, see that those unlabeled samples and, and, and in some scenarios, those are a lot easier to come by than the labeled samples, then we can uh, take advantage of that to under better understand the structure of uh, the points within our feature space, the samples within our feature space, in order to construct this transformation from our original feature space into an unwarped feature space. And then what we can do is train up a much simpler um, model using just the, the samples that are actually labeled. And by simple here, I mean models that are much closer to, uh, to linear in structure. 
All right, so that finishes up our conversation about, uh, about regression in the context of semi-supervised uh, learning. There aren't any tools uh, directly available for doing semi-supervised regression, but we've talked through an algorithm uh, based on what you've already learned about in scikit-learn. So, so I encourage you to, to go find some data sets to, to play with there.